Hey guys, Kyle here. So, just before the show starts, I wanted to mention our Patreon. You can pay us $1 a month as a thank you, as a tip. You can pay $2 a month to get access to one of our bonus content shows, uh, episodes two days early, and a secret Discord chat where all of our Patreon donors get to go and hang out and talk with us directly. Then there's a $5 tier that you can donate to to get access to a whole bunch more content. Uh, we have multiple bonus episodes on there. So please check it out, patreon.com slash it gets weird. Uh, we don't advertise, we don't make money. So check it out and throw some money if you think that would be cool. Thanks. Welcome to It Gets Weird, our comedy show where we explore the unusual, the unbelievable, and the unexplained to try and make your world a little weirder. I'm Kyle. And I'm Niall. And Niall, I I gotta be honest, I, I can't stand being apart for these recordings. After getting <laughs> the taste of it in my mouth, the sweet, sweet nectar of recording in person only for shit to fuck up, uh, and I, I figured I'd go for a classic topic this week uh, as a sort of bonding experience. Uh, I, I I feel like there is kind of a a sense of of yearning in your recent topic you know, <laughs> of the Mandela effect, and now whatever this is that it's just like you're, you're trying to go back to a level of of uh, of simplicity of, of where we first started, where when we first when we you know when we lived together and we're in the same you know we're in the same place at all times. Yeah, well, the only difference really is is that uh, aside from just like not being in the same apartment is like if if we were truly to return to our origins, we'd have to be like getting drunk and and farting on on the mic and stuff, just just getting real rowdy with it. I think yeah, I don't know. That, <laughs> look, I'm not saying I'll never have like cuz like I still occasionally have like a drink while we're recording, but yeah. Uh it's it's it it you know Everything in moderation, especially drunk podcasting. Yeah, well, so. I, I think something that, like, I kind of thought about recently that, like, made me feel really weird. I don't know how to feel about this, but, like, we started this show when I we were, like, 25 years old-ish, right? Yeah. So, yeah. like, it's like, I don't know, just, like, aging, like, this this podcast is documenting the aging process of us. Uh, and that is really weird to think about because like, I think, I think I get noticeably like more old, like older. I don't know. I don't know if you feel that way, but I kind of do. Yeah. I think there, there have been some changes, uh, in, in the five years, but if there, if honestly, if there weren't changes in five years, I think that would be a worse sign. So you know what? that's um, a good point. That's a good. Point. So yeah. So, so what are we, what are we talking about this week, Kyle? Well, Niall, I'm not revisiting a topic really. Uh I'm I'm but I, I saw something that I was like, oh, this is this is the same sort of concept, but this time it's in a different country, which is like kind of one of the flavors that we hit upon sometime where like you know, like the Space Brothers, for instance. Like we talked about Space Brothers at home here in the United States. We've talked about Space Brothers in Italy, I think was like the last time we really talked about it. Um so yeah. you get these like ideas in different places on the planet and they're all very similar. So there is this concept called the like where like UFO sightings just explode over a relatively brief period of time. Um, you know, lots of people report weird things in the sky, strange light, strange lights and even uh, abductions sometimes. Mm -hmm. Now we had the 19 the like late 1950s ufo flap in the united states this week i wanted to talk about a famous ufo flap or wave that occurred in the tail end of the 1980s and into the early 90s uh and i will be surprised if you haven't heard at least this phrase or seen it around online this is the belgian ufo wave i actually have this marked as like a possible topic i have not oh, looked into really? it okay. uh, but i i came across a ufo encounter i think that was involved in this 
Um, okay. But I, I have not researched this topic. So, yeah, I, 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 am, I am aware of this it's, in the vaguest sense. Yeah, it's famous enough that I, I shouldn't be surprised that, that you have, like, a bookmarked page for this. Um, and I've run into it multiple times before I decide, you know what, fuck it, I'm going to do it. Um, now, what the first thing I noticed that's kind of weird about this, for me at least, um, is when I read about this story, I thought for sure that the this this wave couldn't be like the the only UFO sightings they've had in their like history. Um, and I still think that. Yet when I I looked for information on the history of UFOs in Belgium on the English speaking side of the web, you begin with the eighty nine UFO wave basically. Um, but I had trouble finding evidence of things that came prior. Uh, okay. and so I guess what I'm trying to say with that is I, I kind of feel like it might be, um, just like blocked by the, the language barrier. Um, that's my guess with things like this. Uh, so if a listener out there somehow has information on the history of UFOs in Belgium and about stuff that predates the 89 uh, wave, then please shoot us an email. Okay. So, so this uh, glut of sightings began on November 29th, 1989, when approximately 140 some UFO sightings were reported in the region of Eastern Belgium. Uh, this is th Okay. This is, this is happening in like one evening, by the way. Um, and this is mostly near the capital called Yupen. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I'll get that out of the way right now. Uh, not only was there an alarming number of sightings over a very short period of time, but almost all of them made consistent reports of triangular UFOs. Uh, so based on reports, these UFOs spanned about 120 feet, uh, they had white spotlights on each like vertices and a red or orange colored light at its center. Now, aside okay. from these colored lights, the crafts were black and sleek, uh, which like, I don't know. I heard that and it kind of reminded me of like a stealth stealth jet, like an American yeah, stealth yeah, jet. Yeah. But I don't think those were like a thing until later. I don't really know. I don't know the history of, of like our... We I, I think stuff. Garrett would probably be able to tell us. I, yeah. I do not know when the fucking like stealth bomber or whatever that thing's called came about. So I, I just I just looked up the 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 case that I came across that brought me to this was the Voronezh UFO in Russia that also oh. was 1989. So that was like maybe oh. 20 episodes ago or so. Um, OK, I don't know if you came across the Voronezh case, but that that is the uh, that's where I came across this. Just for, for anyone that's like I, that sounds from like. I think I mentioned the the existence of the Belgian UFO wave in that in that episode, maybe, or at least came maybe. It, so yeah, that that I makes a lot curious. of sense. I don't, I didn't run into it, but that does make a lot of sense. And like one of the other things that I remember, um, like like there's talk too, because like th there's talk of like a, a Soviet um, uh, uh, satellite like breaking up in the atmosphere as like maybe being something that contributed to this whole scenario. Uh, but that's like okay. a really that's like a blip uh, because the other theories are don't have anything to do with that. Um, so some reports about these UFOs did include less consistent descriptions. They kind of varied. So this would be things like the craft being, quote unquote, very high and having large windows. Um, OK, and sometimes the central red light blinked on and off. And sometimes it was said that there were quote, strings of lights on the sides. Uh, so, like, you can picture, like, a triangular craft, and it's got, like, its its in, its edges are just, like, str like lights strung along them. Uh, it, it's, I, it's got, like, neon under lights. Like, uh, like if someone didn't go full-blown full, full blown with, like, a, when they were modding out their car with yeah. the actual, like, glow, glow lights, they were just using, like, LED strip lighting. Yeah. Yeah, okay. and funny enough, sometimes the these craft were known to have the nitrous kick in, and they could just, like, <laughs> tear shit the fuck up. Um, no, yeah, yeah. I, I, I get, like, that was, like, one of the things that just, like, it didn't appear, like, a ton of times, but there was one comment about it having, like, a string of lights on the side. And, uh, and one of these UFOs had a mat was, like, bright green and had a massive Hulk fist coming out of it. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's really, honestly, the weirdest uh, detail in this whole thing was the Hulk fist. Yeah. Um, but the thing was consistently very large, usually about a football field's length on average, and one description even reads that, quote, while the object was flying slowly directly overhead, one could not see the front part in the end at the same time because it was too big. Jesus. Okay, so these are like... We're not talking about, like, a, a, a small craft here. We're talking, like, we'll dominate the skyline, especially yeah. if you said, like, 140 of these in a night. Uh, something Well, so 140 sightings, probably of the same craft, but with very descriptions, um, and these reports are... The thing, so not to jump too far ahead, but the reports of this type of craft in the Belgian wave are, like, over the course of almost a year. Um, okay. So... If they change over time, and the information that I was getting was just kind of like, here are the general reports of throughout this event. Uh, but I believe that a lot of the what I'm talking about right now is meant to be focused on the 29th of November in 1989 in that one evening where, like, people supposed 140 people all gave these reports. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this thing's basically a Star Destroyer, right? Like, it's, it's huge, at yeah. least according to some people. So <laughs> So, like, 140 Belgians just, like, witnessed a live-action beginning of A New Hope. Yeah, yeah, th yeah. There's also many reports of a, a, a credit uh, scroll that happened in the sky at that time. It turns out they were just yeah, filming a new Star Wars. It said a long, long time ago, even though it seems like sci-fi, which is usually in the future, and people were confused by that, uh, but have kind of just grown to accept it over the years <laughs> yeah. as it became a cultural phenomenon. Yeah, people were confused about the context of the credit scroll that was happening in the sky <laughs> with the Star Destroyer. It was very, for very confusing. <laughs> for some reason, it uh, the credit scroll started with Palpatine has returned in a Fortnite event. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um, so <laughs> they're all watching this, like, Star Destroyer. In some, like, in some cases, it's not as big it, it depends. It's like from report to report. People are giving varied reports on this thing. Um, and yes, this thing reportedly moved very slowly. Uh, sometimes it would even stop and hover, not moving at all. However, reports also claim that the craft on occasion would just suddenly move at an absurd speed. Uh, and I have a quote here where somebody said, it was moving from one point of the horizon to another point directly opposite in a matter of seconds. I think that's what they would call ludicrous speed. <laughs> yes. This motherfucker went plaid. They, like, they didn't have the technology to capture uh, the moment it goes plaid uh, it, back then. But but now, if we had seen these UFOs now, we would have definitely seen a very, very nice plaid pattern in the sky. Look, I, I'm really sorry to anybody that doesn't want Star Wars or, or fucking... Um... Wow, why am I not... Why am I unable to come up with the Mel, the Mel Brooks movie? Spaceballs? Uh, Spaceballs uh, references in their podcast episodes. This one, this it seems like that's the there, there's always like a vibe that happens in the first like 15 minutes of each episode that we do where it's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, this is what this episode is going to be. And this one just seems like it's going to be like fucking Star Wars references. So the, the vibe has been established. Um, I mean, it fits pretty well. So these craft were like they were typically described as being silent. But there were a couple reports that contradict that where they recall a low humming sound as they hovered overhead. Um, now, here, here we get a, a little bit more of a wild claim. So here's some more of the detailed reports. Uh, quote, in three of the sightings, there were reports that the underside of the craft had heavy metal parts, crisscross effects, diamond shape work, tubular things here and there. Uh, others report... <laughs> okay that one of the triangle crafts constructing itself into a different shape, a circle to be particular, with a circular light, which then let out a large amount of relatively small red objects spreading out in nearly every direction, with the circular craft then turning back into a triangular-shaped craft. So this thing has So drones. we have a bit of a... Yeah, it has drones, and it also is a transformer a little bit. So we've got... Yeah. Maybe not a transformer, but at least has some sort of, like, shape-shifting... Shape mechanism yeah now, it, you were talking about like all the like mechanical stuff that was coming out underneath it it was yeah is there any like detail on that or is it just like it has some some like distinctive patterns it's i only got that like one quote and that's the thing is like 
this, these are these are just like random quotes from like I think a single like one or two people's reports. These are like the kinds of details that just completely differed from the general consensus on the craft that was seen. Um, like th this okay. honestly reads to me like people embellishing, like or or one person embellishing, because this is the only place where I find this version of the account. All the other accounts are just like weird triangle craft with lights at its vertices and at its center, and it hovered and like moved slowly. Uh, uh, alternately, only one person has like a high powered telescope or binoculars. You know, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. You this have, is like, the one, one guy. person who's like who has like a telephoto lens for bird watching or some shit. And it's just like got to see it way closer than everybody else. Yeah. So he's he's kind of in a real chicken little situation where everybody's just like, I don't know. It's just a triangle. And he's like, you have no idea how deep this goes. There's diamond structural patterns and tubular <laughs> bits like, OK, guy, I get okay, it. It looks dude, like a big whatever. block with light on it for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> whatever, man. Um, the other final little tidbit that strays from the norm, it says that some people claim that when they signaled the triangular craft, with their car headlights, the craft would reply with a light pattern that was similar to the pattern of the car lights or would sometimes move as soon as the people would signal the craft. So, All right, so it engages in mimicry. Yeah, there's a lot of people, like, seeing this thing from their cars. Like, so many of these reports were people just, like, in their cars, like, looking out and being like, what the, f what the fuck is that? Um, Now, so since, like, all these specific despite all these specific details like varying from encounter to encounter, like I said, the agreed upon facts were that it was very big. It was triangular and the lights were at that vertices and at that center. Um, and so these initial reports would come after the night that they happen, but there is a, there are like particular stories of encounters with crafts during this time that are sort of the, um, the, the main event, the, the things that kicked off the Belgian wave. So uh, these UFO witnesses, uh, they're the ones that kind of get referenced are highly uh, lauded by the UFO community to this day because of the status of the witnesses who were, of course, policemen. Uh, fucking, uh, of course, <laughs> I, I was yeah. waiting for that. Yeah, yeah. The police got not to get. Sorry, go ahead. No, you just the fact that that. I just need I need one ufologist to say a cap, you know, I yeah. just need like one. <laughs> well, it's like, yeah, it, it's like, I, I don't know. For some reason, police with their highly trained uh, guns and eyes uh, are like somehow not like trapped by the uh, fallibility of like the human senses. So uh, and, and just like generally yeah. eyewitness reports being pretty faulty. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of policemen and then later the military. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, Look, all, all I'm saying is, if you think policemen are, are reliable, watch any body cam footage compared to a police yeah. report, and you will be you will instantly be, be uh, dismissed of, of that idea of that notion, uh, and will that therefore take the town like the guy that just like drifts through town trying to like buy a, a forty is going to be a much more reliable witness. <laughs> we got to start strapping some. Uh some uh, uh you know telescope cams on their vehicles so that we can verify the ufos that they're seeing uh yeah because i i just i what th there's interesting stuff here but i do not believe that these people saw alien crafts that night there there has to be dash cam ufo footage out there right probably i you know what that's interesting because i've never actually looked for that but i've seen like weird shit caught on dash cams like there's the um there's one in russia where like a dash cam caught a uh like a meteorite uh and it's really huge and lights up the entire sky as it enters but i've never actually seen like a ufo on a dash cam i i know I, i've seen like trail cameras catch weird cre creatures and stuff so like they're just just by like process of elimination you think that a dash cam has caught like a ufo somehow it's gotta I'll, i'm gonna have to google that shit when we're done here um yeah so pretty, I, look look broke is like dash cams of car crashes <laughs> woke is dash cam ufo footage for 2022 the, get with yeah we, we're like in the era of like ufo believing so let's start getting dash cam <laughs> ufos <laughs> trending 
I need a compilation of ring camera aliens stealing porch packages. <laughs> well, there, there was that like stupid fucking thing about like the, the alien creature in the person's driveway. And it all turned out to be a goddamn viral campaign for some Harry Potter bullshit. Do yeah, you for, remember like, that? Potter more or some shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, people are saying it was like, it was like a goblin or like a, like a, something like that. And it just turned out to be a fucking viral marketing for some yeah. shitty turfs bullshit. Turn, yeah, but it turns out it was an enslaved house elf, unfortunately. Yeah. So, we, you know, we, we deserve nicer things vis a vis uh, dash cam footage and ring footage, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm anti ring camera in general, but if oh, it gets me sure. UFO footage, I'm with it. Yeah, I'm with it. Uh, so, uh, let, let me just read to you this, this sighting occurs in the same general area as the others about seven miles away from the German border in Yupen. So here's what it says about the encounter with the policeman who actually, when I initially read this story, I didn't know what their names were, but I discovered that they, these, these Belgian policemen did in fact have names because I then watched a 1992 episode of unsolved mysteries. Oh, uh, hell yeah. So season four, episode 10, I believe it was the, this is the police duo uh, who, like, initially saw the craft. Their names are Heinrich Nickel and his partner Hubert von Montigny. Uh, I don't know if that's the... You get the gist. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Yeah. But they they then send a dispatch to another policeman, and that man's name is Albert Kreutz. So, here's the story. Two policemen had seen a very bright light that had lit up their entire car, which they had seen was originating from a black triangular craft. The craft had three lights on each of the vertices and a flashing red light in the center. There was a very low humming sound being emitted from the craft. The craft was very large, and it was at a height of more than 600 to poss possibly 900 feet. One of the police officers stated that the lights being emitted were so bright that we could read a newspaper under it. After this, the craft started slowly moving towards the Gillep Dam, where it's then sat stationary for 45 minutes before moving towards Spa, a city in Belgium, and again sat stationary for 30 minutes, which then the triangular craft disappeared. Uh, another officer, who was located on the third floor of the Yupin station, saw a bright rectangular craft, roughly 65 feet in length, that was between him and the rear wall of the station, which was approximately 650 feet away. After watching it move away and eventually disappear, the officer notified two police officers who were in the area the rectangular craft was moving towards. After approximately seven minutes, the craft was sighted by the officers, and the policemen were able to see the underside of the craft. The policemen notified the Belgian Society for the Study of Space Phenomena about the craft, claiming that it was a triangularly shaped craft, and that while the craft was moving, they noticed a quote-unquote balancing movement as well as a dome on the top surface of the craft. One of the two policemen also apparently stated that the craft was the most beautiful thing he had ever seen. <laughs> so, uh, this guy is just really wow. He hasn't wow. seen a lot of things. No, yeah. I guess not. He has, it, this guy hasn't seen the birth of his own child. He hasn't seen a, a beautiful singer do a, a come up. I'm trying to come up with more beautiful things, and I'm realizing how quickly I'm running dry here. Um, a, 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 a fresh box of dozen donuts. Yes. Uh, oh my God. Yes. <laughs> so that's, that's too easy, but fuck it. No, so I'm with, I'm with th that. This is, I mean, I, I like how many sightings there are of this thing. And they all like, if you take away the like super detailed things of like, you know, that you said like the diamond structure and like the tubular bullshit yeah. and stuff. They, they seem to all be like, OK, it's triangular. It has these lights. It moves reasonably slowly, except for the people that are like, no, it hit the NOS at this time um, or went plaid, whatever reference you want to go with. I, I it, so like it feels like they that you can confirm that something was seen in the sky. And, and like I always when we're talking about UFO cases, one of the first things that like comes to mind is like, are there enough separate accounts that have enough in common that it seems like there actually was something there or is it just like someone making shit up? And this feels like there's enough to say at least something was in the sky, right? Yeah. Yeah. There, there's some, something I think was in the sky. I personally think it was man-made and we'll get to that later, but okay. uh, 
I, I do think people saw something, uh, but like all these good stories about about a quote unquote flap or wave, uh, things just kind of spiral out of control with the media. Um, so, oh, I also wanted to mention that apparently upon initially sighting the object, the cops joked together that it must have been Santa Claus trying to land. Uh, funny joke. I, that, yeah, they're pretty funny, but that's what they say in the episode of Unsolved Mysteries. Um, and by the end of that night, so November the 29th into the 30th, uh, three pairs of police officers and about 30 different groups of people claimed to witness the strange object. So in total, we're talking 143 people saw something weird in the sky that night. So okay. the first to interview the policemen eyewitnesses and publish an article on the November, on the November 29th event was a German tabloid called Grenz Echo. Uh, the policemen were interviewed by lifelong alien believer Heinz Gottesart, uh, who I think worked for the tabloid. And from here, this now public-facing UFO wave would continue for months. Uh, during that time, the Belgian Society for the Study of Space Phenomena, and that also known as SOPEBS from the Belgian name, uh, they would go around interviewing people, documenting eyewitness reports and getting hundreds of hours of audio from these eyewitnesses. And you can also go to that Un Unsolved Mysteries episode and see Belgians talk about the event. Uh, so the wave would truly culminate. This is the big one. Uh, this would be on March 30th, 1990 at about 11 p.m. And so the Belgian military was well aware of the UFO flap that had been going on. Uh, like in between this event and the first one that I mentioned in November of 89, things were like there were sporadic UFO sightings throughout that entire time. Like I, I'll get into it, but I think the, the final count of sightings during the wave was like somewhere over 2000. Um, Damn. Okay. Yeah. So the Belgian military is pretty aware of this UFO situation. Uh, even an army colonel at the time named Andre Amand had reported strange lights in the sky while driving in his car with his wife uh, in, I think, December. So the military involvement, the big the big military part of the story, in uh, it kicks off when a small town control reporting center tracked a mysterious unknown object on radar. What happens next comes from an official summary by retired Major General of the Belgian Air Force, a guy named Wilfried de Brouwer. Uh, at the time of the UFO wave, he was acting as chief operations in the air staff. And so here's what he says in his official report about the incident. Quote, Belgium had no official focal point for reporting UFO observations. And I want to make a side note here and just say, keep that in mind. Because uh, okay. this, this plays into my theory of what happened here. And a lot of people's theory. So I'm, I'm, I'm not unique here, but... Uh, he goes on to say, nevertheless, in my function of chief operations, I was confronted with numerous questions about the origin and nature of these craft. In the first instance, and in consultation with other NATO partners, I could confirm that no flights of stealth aircraft or any other experimental aircraft took place in the airspace of Belgium. In addition, the civil aviation authorities confirmed that no flight plans had been introduced. This implied that the reported objects committed an infraction against the existing aviation rules. The Belgian Air Force tried to identify the alleged intruders and, on three occasions, launched F-16 aircraft. On one occasion, two F-16 registered rapid changes in, in speed and altitude, which were well outside of the performance envelope of existing aircraft. Nevertheless, the pilots could not establish visual contact, and the investigation revealed that specific weather conditions may have caused electromagnetic interferences and false returns on the radar screens. The technical evidence was insufficient to conclude that abnormal air activities took place during that evening. In short, the Belgian UFO wave was exceptional and the Air Force could not identify the nature, origin, and intentions of the reported phenomena. So, let that sink in, I guess. Basically, yeah, they pick up something weird on radar, they scramble some jets from Bovachain Air Base, which also lock radar on something, but then they never establish any actual visual contact. Uh, and the official story that they're saying is like, we looked at this, we're pretty sure this was just some electromagnetic interference that was causing some weird radar stuff. 
uh, and we have no evidence to make any conclusive thing about it. That's that's the whole story from their end. Okay. Do you know how th- this is purely like a a a my my um I I don't know. I I always think of like how would you debunk these things, and and I'm trying to think how many f how many f sixteens was that with the whatever three, whatever the fuck yeah. those, those pl- there were three three of them. Okay. Yeah. Three three of them triangular craft. I uh, there with uh lights on the vertices i guess you could kind of maybe make some correlation there i don't know yeah well that's the thing is like what i think is extremely important in the actual um the actual air force version of the story is that at no point do they ever mention that there is any sort of like craft they didn't even like receive a report of like a triangular craft although they knew of those reports coming in they just like Hey, weird blip on the radar. Let's check it out. Um, and then they never yeah. see anything. Um, so, but I, none of the theories are about the F 16s being confused for UFOs. Uh, although there are supposedly quite a few people who saw them scramble these jets. They saw the jets go out and fly around and look for whatever it was that was on their radar. Um, but the whole thing's inconclusive from their end. That's all well and good, but this is not the uh, quote-unquote unofficial and a little bit more colorful version that the UFO uh, people will tell you. So here's their version of the story. Okay. The main case started on March 30th, 1990, when the supervisor of the Control Reporting Center in a small town of Belgium received reports of a triangular UFO in the sky flying towards the southeast of Brussels. The three lights of the triangular craft were varying in colors, at times being red, yellow, or green. After a short amount of time, the control reporting center requested for the Wavrigan... This is like the the Belgian police. They're called the Wavrigandarmerie to send patrolmen to investigate the sighting of Triangle UFO. After roughly 10 minutes, another triangular craft had been spotted flying towards the original craft. Then, at close to 11.30, the police had established the authenticity of the sightings and the fact that the crafts were detected by the CRF's radar had only added to the authenticity of the sightings as well as confirming it. After being detected by radar, the three lights had moved in closer to each other, thus forming a smaller triangle. Then after receiving a second confirmation of the objects by radar from the traffic center control located in Semmerzeg, Belgium, the control reporting center gave the directive for two F-16 jets to be scrambled from the Bovachain air base in a short time after midnight, all while the crafts are still being seen and have already been seen for more than an hour. The lights were described as relative to each other, not changing position at all, while moving at a slow speed. Two other lights, albeit dimmer than the two other formation of lights, were spotted near Egize, a small town of Belgium. After the F-16s were scrambled, the pilots made nine attempts to intercept the objects. In three of the attempts, the objects were locked on by radar, however, only for a short amount of time, as the objects managed to evade the radar lock on by accelerating to great speeds, and in some cases, faster than the speed of sound. When the first craft was locked on by radar, the object accelerated approximately 950 miles per hour from roughly 149 to about 1,099 miles per hour. The object also descended nearly 3,937 feet in less than two seconds, descending from more than 8,858 feet to nearly 4,921 feet, then ascending nearly 11,000 feet before descending again to near surface height. Even with, it's, it's, yeah, it's like the, what I love about this version of the story is how many numbers they got. They got a lot of details on this one. <laughs> so yeah, th- this, this is like that they, they, you could map this whole thing out very easily. And, and th- this is like storyboards for UFO sighting more than it is like just yeah. a story. I, I don't. And the thing is, here's the thing after reading through a number of articles about this and watching videos, I don't know where this version, the details from this version of the story came from. I cannot, I have a guess, but I don't know. Um, Okay. So uh, even with such great speeds, no sonic boom was heard, despite the fact that the craft accelerated to faster than sound speeds in a matter of seconds. Descriptions of one of the craft, which was a relatively small triangular craft given by people who were watching the UFOs, are in agreement with what was shown on radar. 
People watching the craft report that the smaller triangle disappeared, possibly dimmed out, for a short amount of time, and while this was occurring, a larger triangular craft swiftly ascended while the F-16s were moving next to it, possibly while the jets were attempting to intercept the craft. At, a, at I believe, 140, radar locked onto one of the crafts, only for the craft to once again evade the radar uh, lock-on by accelerating more than 596 miles per hour. The F-16's Traffic Center Control and Control Reporting Center all lost radar detection of the object after this. Soon after, the F-16s flew back to the airbase a little after 2 a.m. Now, that is the very weirdly detailed version that confirms that they basically got into a, a whole scuffle with UFO. that, like, these F-16s went and, like, chased down UFOs that people were seeing. Um, yeah, that, that is much different than the quote-unquote official report from the military that you were talking about, where it's just yeah. like, yeah, we went out there, we didn't really see anything. We definitely didn't see something like breaking the sound barrier right. Uh, right. And, and fucking ascending and descending rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. They, they went out and they, this is actually when Sonic the Hedgehog uh, entered our planet from Mobius. Uh, yeah. It turns out because he's breaking the sound barrier, but he's not making any noise except a, a fun little ring ring noise that, that Sonic that, you know, the noise that I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Um, I'm well aware. So yeah. I've seen I, the movie. Yeah, exactly. Imagine being the person who's seen the Sonic the Hedgehog movie and has never experienced any Sonic content outside of that. Yeah, I <laughs> like if 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 so, for those people that ex, that have to exist where the movie is their only like exposure to Sonic the Hedgehog, they have to think that James Marsden is more important to Sonic canon than <laughs> Tails. Oh, and th that is that is a wild world to live in. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, keep these conflicting stories in mind here. This is I'm, I'm not I'm not really trying to discount either story, but it just it, I want it to be known that the reports of UFO sightings that were supposedly happening concurrently with the Air Force's account of events they seem, in my opinion, to have gotten conflated over time, uh, especially when shared in online UFO circles. Because basically, what's happening here is we have the official report that the military would give later about what happened. But then you would also like, just like the first time this all happened uh, in November of 89, people's like reports of what they saw during the scrambling of the F-16s comes like within the two weeks after it happened. So it's not like people are rushing to their phones to be like, oh shit, I just saw jet planes chasing UFOs. Like yeah. they're, they're calling, they're like, reporting this stuff later um and so it gets like mixed up i guess uh and, and that's kind of what i'm trying to say so uh yeah months later others would come forward claiming to have witnessed the ufos and the jets that night uh and also within the first couple weeks no reports were actually received from the public on the night of the occurrence so regardless of that we're looking at some two that like i said some 2000 ufo sightings over the span of what would end up being nearly a year and the mass sightings would begin to sort of peter out a number of months after the March sightings. And in March, people received news that there was a big breakthrough in evidence. Uh, and that would be a photo of one of these triangle UFOs that was published. And this is kind of wild because, like, sure, people didn't yet have cell phone cameras, but consumer-grade film cameras and whatnot, those were readily available. So why there were no photos or footage in all this time is, is a bit of a question, but in March of 1990, they finally got a photo. So, uh, that this all changed with the petite Richain photo. Uh, the photo was supposedly taken in April of 1990 in petite Richain. Uh, I, I've just sense I'm butchering that Belgium. Uh, this is petite Richain, Belgium, and this was done by a 20-year-old man only going by the name Patrick. And the Belgian UFO researchers at SABEPS investigated the photo submitted by the anonymous Patrick and determined it to be authentic. So if you look up Belgian UFO on Google Images, you will find this, like, very, very easily. Skeptics for years contested that there's no background in the photo, therefore this doesn't really give a good basis to determine authenticity, but SABEPS disagreed. So... 
go ahead and Google that right now. Is it? It's a triangular craft. It's kind of blurry. It's got the lights, and there is no background, just like a darkness. Uh, so that that came out, and that was a big fucking deal, especially in the tabloids. But I wanna I wanna take a second to talk about Sobeps. Is that okay? Can I talk about these guys for a minute, Niall? Is that cool? Yeah, I just I think I just found the photo. If okay. you literally if you look at Belgian UFO, it pops up on like the front page of Google. Yeah. Like it's yeah, you, you'll it is, find uh, it. remarkably easy. easy to find. Okay, yeah, this is this is about what I what I've been imagining all along. Now I do I do agree that there's not really a good um, sense of like scale or background in this photo. Yeah. I can agree with that, but it is it is it is a big weird craft with a That's bunch true. of light, with four lights on it. So that's true. That's something. Yeah. Check it out. Uh, or just look at what will probably be the um the uh the episode thumbnail probably. Uh so one of the main guys working for Sabeps, which if you'll recall that is the Belgian Society for the Study of Space Phenomena. Uh this was mm-hmm. a guy who was a professor of physics named August August Misen. Uh Misen was a true believer in the alien visitation theory of UFOs. And after the Belgium UFO wave began in earnest post-publication in a German tabloid, Miesen had begun tracking down witnesses himself on behalf of Sabeps and recording their stories, uh, including an interview with the two policemen, Nicole and Montigny. So I mentioned briefly before how the Belgian military didn't really have a central unit for handling and like processing UFO cases at the time. So this coupled with the sort of, I guess, I don't know, like entertaining spicy stories that they were getting for publication, this allowed a, like an opening for Sabeps to, I mean, ironically, a UFO sort of conspiracy group, they're controlling the narrative. Uh, so some would argue this. Skeptics tend to point out that Misen and Sabeps would basically be the primary source of information on these cases in Belgian media while all the shit went down. So like, they have nobody like there's nobody out there who's just like, hey, can we get the military to like step in and be like, don't worry about this. This is here's the explanation for what you saw in the sky. Uh, instead, it's just like a UFO group who fully believes that aliens are visiting Earth, just telling the media what's going on. Um, which is pretty okay. wild to me. Yeah. So a year after the 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 wave. Uh, Sabeps would publish a book from which the story would get its name titled The Belgian UFO Wave. Uh, Miesen authored the book, and ever since its publication, the text has been a primary source for the story. So when I earlier was talking about all the, like, details about the night of the the F-16s, which sounds kind of like a cool, like, weird horror movie. uh, (laughs) It it sounds like something that, like, uh, that, that... Bruce Willis would make right now and you you wouldn't know it exists until it shows up on for free on Amazon Prime. Yeah, well it's it's either like it's either like a weirdly patriotic like movie of some sort or it's just like a man who is being just like terrorized by F16s like buzzing his house at like extremely <laughs> low heights or something like that. Um so yeah. So yeah, they they published this book. It's a primary source and I believe that that is where the details of the, the F-16 event, like, I believe that's where all those are like, Hey, we saw UFO. It was like split up into these lights and then it came together and as a triangle and pretty sure that's coming from this book. Uh, okay. But, but not the like super specific, this is the height, then the height, then the depth, then the height, like, no, I I, no, that's what I'm saying. I think that that's where all that came from. Um, okay. Cause like, like the the whole idea here was that like when they cataloged all these reports, it was just like this guy who was like feverishly trying to push a an alien visitation theory, uh, and and probably didn't fully represent the uh the like policemen and stuff accurately. And plus, what they like, I don't think that there was like an official story on the F sixteens outside of like reports until the military stepped in and was like here's our official report on what happened that night um okay so while alien visitation isn't like this universal ufologist theory this is the one that sob ran with 
And it, it just like sort of solidified the extraterrestrial slant to the Belgian UFO wave uh, story. Now, for years, the Belgian UFO wave was infamous for seemingly having, quote unquote, no explanation. Uh, and skeptics throughout the years have, of course, offered up their theories. And a lot of it does just come down to accusations of the shoddy, biased work of Sabets. Uh, in 1992, author Mark Hallett wrote on the subject in an essay titled The Belgian UFO Wave or The Triumph of Misinformation. So pretty, <laughs> pretty damning. Read him for filth. Yeah, yeah. for real. Um, his theory was essentially that the media craze that was mostly informed by Sabeps fed into itself, leading to mass delusion. Uh, and a couple articles, when they talk about this, they cite uh, Philip Klass, who's a skeptical UFO researcher, and he has this, like, law or, like, maxim about these type types of UFO events. So he says, Once news coverage leads the public to believe that UFOs may be in the vicinity, there are numerous natural and man-made objects which, especially seen at night, can take on unusual characteristics in the minds of hopeful viewers. The UFO reports in turn add to the mass excitement, which encourages still more observers to watch for UFOs. This situation feeds upon itself until such time as the media lose interest in the subject, and then the flap quickly runs out of steam. So I really think that these kind of, that kind of theory accounts for a lot of like rashes of like cryptid yes. sightings, UFO yes. sightings. Like it, it, there's so much about the the ability of the brain to just like look for what it wants. Yeah, that yeah. I, I I think that is a massive impact um in terms of like not not like actual mass hysteria or anything but just mass sightings of a thing because people want to be involved in in a in a thing that's happening yeah well like so uh skeptoid did a really good episode on this uh topic and they kind of talk about how it's like you saw something maybe a few nights ago and you are like a, a kind of person who's inclined to believe in this stuff and you saw like maybe like a, a particularly bright star and it was weird. And then like you start hearing about stories of UFOs and then it, you retroactively say to yourself, ah, well, that had to be a UFO. Uh, and, and then you like send in your report of like a UFO encounter. That's and that's how they tend to spread. That's kind of the idea here. And, and yeah, it's mass hysteria is maybe a bit of a loaded term or and, and lo even even mass delusion. But like that's, I think, the closest thing you can really used to describe what's going on here it's a psychological event for the most part um yeah so yeah makes sense. Uh, in 1993 researchers pierre mcgain and mark remy put out an article in a publication called physicalia magazine and in it they explain how many of the sightings during the during the belgian ufo wave can be explained as helicopter sightings uh while most reports claim the ufos were silent others reference a low humming sound this would match up with helicopters, while the witnesses to silent craft could have had sound drowned out by the idling of their own motor vehicles or strong winds. Um, so, yeah, like, especially if you're thinking about this as happening, like, later at night, too, and you, like, see these, like, hovering lights and, like, maybe there's a low hum. And, like, you, when you look in the darkness, like, your brain is maybe going to form some images. Um, I, I feel yeah. like I talked about this on the podcast before. But like I, I had um, there was a time that I, I like sticks out so hard in my brain where I went and slept on the couch in the middle of my parents uh, uh, living room when I was like, I don't know how old I was. I had to have been in like middle school. I can't remember why I ended up sleeping out there. I think I just like fell asleep on the couch and then my parents like got up and like turned off the TV, turned off all the lights and left me to let me just sleep on the couch. And I remember waking up at like 2 a.m. and looking across the room and it's extremely dark, but I could kind of make out the um, the forms of some stuff in front of me. And one of the things that I saw was an electrical outlet with a plug and a wire coming out of it. And I remember distinctly seeing that wire that was coming out of the outlet start to like move like a snake. Um, oh, okay. But, you know, rationally, that's not what was happening. It was just very dark, and I, my eyes were, like, tricking the fuck out of me. It freaked me out at the time, and then I woke up, and, never, you know, there wasn't any wire moving around and stuff. So that, like, 
that sticks out in my brain is like, I kind of like am relating that to the idea of like, you're like, you're like, pro, pro, like seeing things in the like low light uh, and a helicopter hovering overhead is like turning into a triangle to your brain. And then people report on the story of a triangle and that's fixed in people's brains because of the media and blah, blah, blah. So you see where this is going. Yeah. I, I think, I think a lot of that makes sense. And I, I think that accounts for it, a lot of, especially group UFO sightings for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to me though, the most damning aspect of all of this has to do with the, that military like experience versus the public reports. So not only do the Air Force pilots in the official reports see absolutely nothing, but SOBEPs would end up reporting the event with the F-16 very inaccurately. Uh, the military say that they reported three radar lock-ons, uh, but the version that would get published and pushed by SOBEPs was that the F-16s made nine radar locks. Uh, furthermore, after analyzing the data, the Belgian military, of course, concluded that these radar locks were... <laughs> Not only, like, there was, like, part of this whole situation that had to deal with this atmospheric phenomenon called Bragg scattering, which is, like, it's it's basically interference caused by the reflection of electromagnetic waves hitting these, like, particular surfaces. But not only were there not nine radar lock-ons, there were three, but those three radar locks, when they're out there, like, searching for whatever was on their radar, it was the pilots locking mm -hmm. onto each other. That makes sense. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so like, they put out this report saying, like, yeah, uh, nothing happened. And they're like, radar locks? Well, clearly there were nine of them. And the thing was very, like, we measured it at going at five million miles an hour. Like, it's just, I don't know. It's just so funny how it uh, completely deteriorated in the hands of the uh, UFO group. Uh, so... Yeah. Look, it, it's, it, look just, just because you have access to the data doesn't mean that you can interpret it correctly like <laughs> yeah. it, it, especially if you come in with the bias of wanting it to be ufo right. you can read stuff like that like radar signals incredibly differently right. than, than they would actually be read exactly they they wanted it to be ufos so they're going to match the data to make it look like it's ufos of course um so on july 27th 2011 uh an article was published concerning the petite retain photo uh and this article is titled Belgian hit UFO image was polystyrene, says Forger. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, fantastic. So here's here's what the article says. It's a very it's short and sweet. A Belgian UFO photograph that became a worldwide hit was faked with a piece of polystyrene. One of the people behind the picture has revealed more than twenty years later in a TV interview. You can do a lot with little. We managed to trick everyone with a piece of polystyrene, said one of the forgers, identified only as Patrick, who says he pulled it off at the age of 18 with some colleagues. We made the model with polystyrene. We painted it, and then we started sticking things to it. Then we suspended it in the air. Then we took the photo, he said in an interview with French-language broadcaster RTL, which was transmitted late on Tuesday. The photograph, taken in 1990, became a sensation after it was circulated around the world. It became known as Petit Rechain Picture after the Belgian town where it was supported, purported to have been taken. So one little more, one, one more little nail in the coffin on the Belgian wave. Um, <laughs> and that straight up, like this might be the lowest, uh, the lowest uh, production value hoax UFO thing <laughs> that we've come across. I mean, like a little, just a little bit of polystyrene and some, some paint. That's true. I I also always laugh when I reflect on the um the chicken coop light with the Adamski photo. Yep. It's like that thing is just like like that thing's only cheaper if he just like went and fucking found it somewhere. You know, like he's just like, oh my friend's got keeps chickens. I'm just gonna go borrow this real quick, snap a couple photos. Uh but yeah, this this person just like hovered polystyrene and took a photo. Uh amazing. Um, it makes plan nine seem like it uh, seemed like a, a real big budget, production, you know? Yeah. Big, big production value. Um, so if, if you guys want to, if you folks out there want to like look into this, uh, a lot of my sources were mainly from a uh, skeptoid who did an ep episode on this. Uh, a, a, I think a magazine it was, it was a website called the week. 
uh, W-E-E-K. And then, of course, I got to visit one of my other favorite websites for this show, Above Top Secret. Oh, fantastic. Good, so, good, good site. <laughs> really, really good site for this stuff. That's where I got a lot of the UFO side of things. Um, a great, great website. I highly recommend if you find this stuff interesting. So, Nile. That brings yeah. me to the big question. Are you ready? Oh, I'm always ready. Excellent. Um, I couldn't stop thinking about Belgian waffles while I researched this. Uh, if you could share any one cuisine with an extraterrestrial visitor, what would it be and why? And then I have a little note here that says I'm hungry. I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. This does sound like a question that you made while you while you were a little, uh, maybe a little peckish, but... Look, you got you got to find your inspiration where you can find it at this point. We've done uh, two hundred and whatever big questions, however many whatever episode this is. I can't remember anymore. So, if I were to share like a singular dish with an extraterrestrial, I feel like I would love to um, do like a uh, like a like a um, oh, what do they call it? Like an etouffee kind of thing, like something with like rice, like. I, I'm thinking yats for those in Indiana. Um, that that's highly regional, but it's it's like a Cajun restaurant. Um, just because I feel like it's very like intense and like has a lot going on and is very like filled with spices and rich and and like it's served over rice, so you get like a bunch of like texture and stuff in it. I, I feel like that something like that is just like a good a good thing to like you know, maybe show an alien what this planet has to offer. You get it started with something real hearty and warm and like comforting and really like flavorful and intense, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's, that's a pretty good way. I mean, like you're kind of giving just like a, a, a sampling of all these different uh, flavors. I, I think that's a really good place to start an ET. Just like start them with something that shows just how, uh, how much we love spices. Yeah, because I feel like um, what 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 it will impart upon people uh, from 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 a different place is like this isn't a planet where we only uh, value sustenance. We value uh, flavor and excess. Despite I what guess. some people would have you thinking. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, because we could just eat something that's like nutritious and and bland, but no, we're gonna fucking bam. We're gonna we're gonna. F <laughs> We're going to really make this thing rich and, and intense. Absolutely. Um, I personally can't, can't take my mind off of Belgian waffles, but I think, I think I need to show, I need to show them breakfast, Nile. That's, that's the thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I would probably roll out just like a, a breakfast feast. You know, we got, we got an omelet. We got waffles. We got pancakes, bacon, a fruit bowl. Maybe I'm thinking. <laughs> so you're just gonna take you're gonna take these aliens to a fucking Denny's. I'm taking them to Denny's. <laughs> That's right. Oh man, maybe Waffle House. I don't know. <laughs> Waffle uh, House, Denny's. What? Either way, as long as they get to sample that classic diner food, um, I'm all about that. <laughs> Get that gray Grand Slam. <laughs> I wish I could take a gray back in time and have them sample a Hobbit hole. Was that the, the mozzarella stick sandwich I, you liked I, in high school? Oh, no, no. I don't know what that was. That was some sort of fucking promotional item for the Lord of the... Not the Lord of the Rings, for the, the Hobbit movies, and you could get a Hobbit hole. Mm. I believe it involves sausage. Um, uh, oh, Don't tell me a Hobbit hole involves sausage. <laughs> You can't just leave it at that, you perv. I, so, I genuinely I, don't know. I, yeah, maybe we should just in, invite all of all of alien races to to get a full English breakfast. You know, get some like black pudding and shit. Excellent, or Yorkshire oh pudding. Whatever yeah, we're the fuck. really fuck yeah. them up. Oh man, <laughs> I do. I do think like a ridiculous breakfast meal would be a hell of a way to introduce like earth food to aliens just because it's like why how why do you eat all of this like what what is oh yeah like is but this it, is this it, like helpful yeah no. like we we like imagine like bringing in an alien like race that like is unfamiliar with the concept of greece 
and you just like yeah. you just sit them down to a sloppy Denny's, you're gonna you're gonna fuck them up for life probably. But I think they're it's gonna be a good fuck them up. They're gonna really acclimate to like Earth culture pretty quickly. Yeah, this this is this is how you start your day, and then you need a nap afterwards. Like that's 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 kind of the point of of this whole thing, uh, which I do think is like a good way to introduce into Earth culture. So just, I, I just think a, that's all. A crowd of a crowd of aliens just like taking a nap on their black their sleek black triangular UFO. I love it. Yeah. Well, my, that about wraps right. this one up. What do you think? Yeah, let's go ahead and take care of some business. Uh, so if you want to follow us, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at IGW Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook.com slash It Gets Weird Podcast. And we're on all your favorite podcatchers from Stitcher to Google Play to Apple Podcasts to Spotify. I think Spotify has ratings now, so go ahead and throw that five stars at us on Spotify. Uh, that would be cool because that, like, ob- over the past couple of years, Spotify has just, like, taken over uh, our podcast listenership, which I wasn't expecting. So uh, go ahead go ahead and rate us on there. Five stars if you wouldn't mind. Please. Please, I would love that. And of course, it gets weird podcast at gmail.com. Send us all your favorite little stories. We love getting them. We love reading them. And sometimes we read them on the show. Uh, and then, of course, they provide a delicious meal for us and maybe an extraterrestrial visitor the next time they, they swing around. We'll, we'll show them how we do it. Uh, and then, of course, patreon.com slash it gets weird. Look, we would really appreciate if you donate to us. That would be super fucking awesome. We have a $2 tier. We have a $2 tier where you get to listen to our bonus series called It Gets Weird TV, where we tackle a weird television show. Right now we're watching Gravity Falls, season one. Uh, You also get the uh, access to our super secret Discord. At the $5 tier, you get access to even more bonus content and the Discord. Uh, Whether you donate at the $2 tier or the $5 tier, you get access to our mainline episodes two days early on Friday instead of Sunday on your own super secret feed. Uh, and Jesus, am I missing anything else? My brain is I'm, I'm in a little bit of a fog here. Uh, I, I like when I can tell anytime like one of us does something like this slightly out of order. It throws us off entirely <laughs> because this has become such just like a rote memorization thing. So anytime you go off script, it it. <laughs> you have to like really write yourself it happens to me too yeah. it's really fun well whether you donate at the two dollar or the five dollar tier you get access to the discord the early episodes if you can't donate to those tiers then you get the one dollar level where you just kick us a buck and say hey we, i like what you do here's a tip so please check out our patreon and if you can't donate then please tell your friends tell your enemies and tell your congressman check out it gets weird podcast all right so I think on that note, we'll go and wrap this one up. Uh, thank you all for listening. I've been Niall. And I'm Kyle signing out. Peace. <laughs>